All right, Hilding. So, what we, where, where would you like us to look, or what do you, what do you want to do? No, uh, I probably should have thought of that, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think. I mean, we can put ourselves, I guess, like here, looking at. If you want to, so we can look this way. We could. Yeah. Well, we start. I guess we should start with the moon. Okay. Um. I guess probably. How do we want to think about this? From do you want to come in from the astronomer's perspective, or for, from other perspectives, or what's the Ojibwe word for the moon? Maria. Oh, Nibwe Jesus, or Nukamas. Oh, okay. Like grandmother moon. Yeah. And where you're from, do you know what the word is? No, but we actually use different words depending on the time of year. Oh yeah, like what? Oh. Uh, so I could tr the like translations use like I think right now is. Um, Fish spawning time. Uh -huh. and then uh, around Christmas, it's what we call chief moon, and then like ice breaking and, and snow blindness and like that. It's basically like a, it's calendar. Right. So that's very similar because of um, how we would think of like the, the months mm -hmm. here. So another kind of seasonal. What, do, what about you, Jason? I actually don't know that word. I was just thinking about it. As soon as I asked the question, I started to regret it because I knew it would circle back <laughs> And around. if I think, if I actually looked it up, I would probably find that there is a uh, normid wor or a word for the moon any time, but I don't know it. Oh, okay. I, I don't speak my language, unfortunately. But it's interesting to, to, to think about that it's, yeah. it's all contextual the entire time. Yeah. But, oh, cool. All right. Um, yeah, but I always, always think like thinking about the moon and how it's you know framed as grandmother moon and most, most cultured nations I think by the grandmother sometimes grandfather, mm -hmm. and that sort of familiar familiarity and relationship, and that with the sun being the partner, and how it's meant to how it's like a nurturing and connection, as opposed to moon, which just sounds like a cow that's fell over or something. <laughs> Yeah, where does that word come from? I don't know. Lots of ooh. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't Latin, but uh, well, what do you find? What's your most interesting like fact about the moon, or what? What do you find? Well, if you were going to do a dating at profile for the moon, <laughs> you know. <laughs> hello, hello, people. I'm the moon. I'm slowly t turning you around, slower and slower as I go away and away. So catch me while you can, because I'll be gone in a few billion years. <gasps> what do you mean by that? Well, we have tides, and tides are caused by the moon, right? Yeah. And so that that tides is deforming the Earth, and it's, it causes like friction because the Earth doesn't like it, and that takes energy away from the Earth-Moon system. So when the, when we have the tides slowing, that slows down the Earth's rotation the moon gets further away at the same time. So our day gets longer and the moon gets smaller. And so is it is its orbit like kind of degrading so it's, it'll eventually spin off? Eventually, in like billions of years, uh, in a long time from now, yeah. When everything ends, right? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a race. I mean, the sun will probably engulf us before that happens, but okay. yeah. But mathematically, you've, it's been calculated that the sun is, yeah. the moon is, uh, is I, leaving slowly. Yeah. You can actually calculate how much longer the day gets, something like um, a millisecond, a millennia, or something like that. Uh, and the other one is the, the Earth Moon are the only places where we can have a total solar eclipse in our solar system. So, anywhere else, when the moon passes from the sun, the sun is too small, so it just blocks it out completely, and as opposed to getting that corona, mm -hmm. or, or the sun is too big if you're, and you can't see it. So this, we're the only place where we actually have a in the solar system with a total solar eclipse, which I think is actually pretty cool too. It's a weird phenomenon how the moon and the sun are the same size here. Visually. Right? Visually, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So we really are seeing that balance and symmetry when you talk about the, the sun and the moon yep. on Earth or from Earth. So we're looking at the moon, Hilding, and it looks like the moon is like centering, caught between two, two bodies up there, right? Yeah. Do you, what do you, what do you think those? I mean, there's a plane at the bottom, but what are what are those two? Those are the two most visible. So. So I think, and I'm never I'm never very good at this, but the one on the left, I believe, is Jupiter. 
Mm -hmm. And the one on the upper right is Saturn. Whoa. Right, so the planets are really bright. Uh, yeah, especially Jupiter and Mars, but we can't see Mars right now because it's on the other side of the Earth from us, facing. So we'd see it during the day, but not right during the night. And Venus is even brighter, but we only see Venus in the morning or, or, sun, or, or in the evening. This is actually the first time anyone's live has ever identified planets that I'm looking at in real time. I didn't. I used my watch out. But you know, when <laughs> you're, here, but you're here. And you're like, oh, this is this planet. Usually, I'm used to, I'm used to everything being interpreted through a screen. Ah, uh, yes. Right? That's too bad because a couple of weeks ago we did the planet viewing party where we actually had great observations of Jupiter. Oh, really? and we're screening them across Canada. Wow. So you can see like the bands going across it. We couldn't see the great red spot because it was facing away at the time, but you can see the bands and then you can see the, some of the moons of Jupiter too, because they were overexposing it. So yeah. what is your relationship with the solar system and the planets professionally? Very little. Okay. I mostly work on other stars. Oh, okay. Um, but I think in terms of our solar system, some of the things that I'm interested in is relates to other stars is I look at exo uh, planets that orbit other stars. Mm -hmm. and so how we sort of only understand them from our own, from the perspective of our own solar system. So like we will see planets that end up looking like Jupiter, but they're really close to their host star, like much closer than Mercury is, and we don't understand, but we basically think it's like Jupiter. And so that's, so my relationship is a little bit uh, off from there. Okay. Uh, in Canada, there are very few planetary astronomers, like we have work in our sol stuff in our solar system. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So your your stars then? Mo yeah, for the most part. So what do you know? So what are the things? Oh, okay. So Marie and I are, are very interested in like objects that are mirrored or um, intersected, you know, or twins, those kinds of things. And I know there's binary stars. Mm -hmm. Yep. Can you tell me something like, you know, no dating app kind of thing, but like, what is what is of interest about binary stars? Because I'm I'm finding it hard to comprehend those kinds of bodies like that. Well, or that kind of energy. Binaries go around each other in the same way the Earth goes around. So it's just gravity. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, they have to almost entirely always form together from a cloud. So you have like a dust cloud or a gas cloud, and when the stars form, that cloud collapses, and when it collapses, it spins faster. Think of it like a figure skater, right? The, when, when the figure skaters' arms are, they spin slowly. When they put their arms in, they spin faster. And when it comes together, if you, you, we think that would form one star. But there's some instability or some weird dynamic. Sometimes you might get like a barbell, and you form two stars, and they come together. And you know, for stars like our sun, about half of them, half of them have companions and binaries. This is really kind of important for us because one of the hardest things to do uh, with understanding stars is weighing them. We don't know how, we, when we look at a star like the, uh, that one on top, those two up top there, yeah. or right over our heads, you know, I can't look at them and, and tell you how massive they are. Whether it's the same like our sun, whether it's half, whether it's 10 times or 100 times the mass of our sun. But binaries, we can do that because it's, it's force of gravity, right? They're, they're, they're spinning around each other, and we measure them. We measure them using when one passes in front of the other. So you have like two stars here, very bright. One in front of the other, you block light, and then you block light. And we can measure it that way. Or we break the, spe we break the light down in the, in the parts, into the spectrum. Like, think of it like, uh, you know, you have those little prisms in your home window, perhaps, and you get the rainbows in the good day. Same idea, just way finer. So you can see little lines in that rainbow. And those lines are molecules and atoms that represent the composition and properties of the star. But when, they, when, the, plant, when the stars are moving relative to each other, those lines shift back and forth. The same way, you know, you have a train coming and you, it makes a sound and the sound, the pitch changes as it gets closer and passes you by. It's kind of the exact same physics. And we can use that to measure how heavy they are. And really we need that information because basically everything we understand about stars comes from actually weighing them. And so that's, binaries are really important for that. And right now we're seeing the bigger, some really big kind of results of this is because there th there's an observatory called LIGO. So this is, sorry, 
laser interferometry Thank gravitational you. oscillations. <laughs> Astronomers and acronyms are is the worst part of my field. <laughs> and what this what this does is it's searching for gravitational waves. And these are things that in the theory of relativity, if you have like two objects orbiting each other and their orbits changing, they're bending space because gravity is about bending space. And so when they're going around, it's like stirring a pot and you, you generate waves that go out into space. And so when, when the waves hit you, your, your body distorts, but that distortion is way less than the radius of an atom. And you know, like my friend tells me, if you do this long enough, you actually generate gravitational waves. You'll never notice them, but you do it. And so we're detecting these gravitational waves and they're coming from the mergers of two black holes. And these black holes are, are born from these binary, from the most massive of binary stars. And so binary stars are incredibly important for understanding things like the, the properties of stars, black holes, and then we take and apply them to other galaxies. And that helps us do things like cosmology. So these binary stars really anchor a lot of our understanding of the universe. Thanks to that symmetry. And we just talked about how the, the the orbit of the moon and the earth is, I don't want to use the word degrading, but it's it's changing over time, so eventually they, they will not, they will separate. Mm -hmm. What's the condition for the binary stars? Do they eventually over time, are they calculated to be combined? Will they get closer or will they, or will they split apart even further? So the What's reason the, the moon and the earth are separating is because the tides, right, the tides. cause friction. So because the Earth is spinning at one rate and the Moon orbits at another rate, mm -hmm. what, tr what it's trying to do is trying to sync up oh. so that the spin of the Earth will match the orbit of the Moon. Right. And stars do the exact same thing. We have, there are tides on stars. And so you can do that same distortion and they will synchronize and do this. But there are also a lot of stars that appear to be two stars that have merged at some point. So that does happen usually from different physics. Usually the tidal physics uh, reaches some equilibrium eventually. But yeah, same phys is the exact same physics. Like I have a student who's working on this right now for a type of star and understanding how tides and those interactions help uh, the stars evolve. Wow. Stars, stars have tides. That's stars really amazing. Have tides, yeah. That's a great visuality to try to come up with. Yeah, well, from my perspective, you can think of it. So if you have a star that's going around and this going around this star and this star is spinning at some rate that's slower or faster you'll see like a bright spot either in the behind the orbit or ahead of the orbit and that's basically due to a tidal bulge we see them sometimes with the most with massive stars but it's hard to infer wow. so yeah it sounds like you're talking it's interesting to think about the stars and planets as being about relationships in that way, right? Relationship to each other. Yeah, I think everything in, in the universe related from, at massive scales was related to stars and physics. So you, when the universe was born, there was hydrogen, helium, and a little tiny bit of lithium. Everything else came from stars. So our oxygen, our iron, our copper, our gold, our silver all came from stars in different interactions, whether it's in the core of the stars where you, we use nuclear fusion to create energy, or when stars explode in supernovae, or when, when stars called neutron stars that are basically giant neutrons in, in a bundle merge together, and then they explode and they create all kinds of things as well. And so, you know, everything that allows us to exist was basically born in a star at one point. And then there's the relationship in dynamics. I mean, we, couldn't, we can't have the Earth in our solar system if we didn't have the sun. Because when, you know, we, the idea is when the sun formed, it was a gas cloud collapsing. And when you get that, when it collapses, it spins faster. And like thinking pizza dough throwing in the air stretches out into a disc. Yeah. And that allowed the planets to form. At least that's what we think. We actually don't totally understand how planets form. And so we have all these, we have that relationship too. So everything, that is about us comes from the stars. And the same thing, you know, it's like from the, uh, you know, Kree and Mi'kmaq and I think Anishinaabe traditions that we come from the stars. This is one element of that is we literally come from the stars. Yeah, things are lining up. It's all matching up there. <laughs> wow. I had heard that all gold comes from stars, but I wasn't aware that just about everything else also Yeah, does. how that worked, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And huh. that we are, our elements are, of course, made up of stars as well. So. It's also, you know, hearing you talk about it, I mean, you have really good visuals as well to help me understand. And I'm so aware of um, that distance between something that is so beyond us and so far away and that you're studying it from at such a distance mm -hmm. and then how you can also um, visualize that. So I'm thinking about like how you understand um, the distance, the, the space, you know, all the, um, other stuff around measuring all of that, the physics, and is that information, are you going between like a telescope and then also a lot of information that is like, I guess it used to be writing, but now it's computer, like how do you process I, it? Yeah, I spend way too much time at phone computers, uh, like a giant, like I'm, I'm a giant nerd, and a lot of it is programming. Most of how we understand stellar physics comes from giant computer programs that we run. So the, these programs will talk, do things like fluid dynamics, nuclear reactions, magnetic fields, and we evolve them over time. And that's okay. basically how we understand this. And it started off pen and paper. Right. And, and people work sort of computers. They were, we would call people who did this computers. Right. And we build up all these programs and then we test it with observations. Because really until only a few years ago, everything about the astronomy came from light and photons. And it's sort of like taking a painting, sitting here, observing it in Hamilton yeah. through a telescope, and trying to figure <laughs> out how the painter, what, what composition the painter used of the paint, how dense was the paint, what was the canvas made that's out ridiculous. of. That's <laughs> ridiculous. And that's really what we're trying to do. It's a strong telescope. <laughs> and so we try to infer this in that way from the light. In recent years, we have the gravitational wave oscillations. And if you go to Sudbury, we have neutrinos. So neutrinos are really cool too, because if you hold your hand out, that's like a trillion neutrinos just went through my hand. Now that's kind of a stupid number that means nothing, but that's what they do. They're these really subatomic particles that are created in nuclear reactions. So in the sun, nuclear fusion occurs when we take one hydrogen atom, one hydrogen atom, and you bash it together and you create a, a deuterium, which is a special kind of hydrogen, and you keep going, you keep building it up. But new, neutrinos are these little subatomic particles that are in the byproduct. And they don't interact with matter almost entirely. So they'll just zip from the sun and get to here very quickly. You know, whereas light takes 100,000 years to get from the core of the sun to the surface. Four, it takes four to eight minutes to get to us. But neutrinos, they just zip here in eight minutes. And they go through just about everything. And so, in Sudbury, in the mines, they basically took a giant pot of water, a special kind of water called heavy water, which is uh, a different kind of hydrogen put together, and they buried it in the water and they surrounded it by these kind of photoreceptors. So the neutrinos would hit the water, it would create a reaction, might create a reaction, and it would shine, shine a little light and it would detect it. And this was done in the last 20 years and we were doing, we were able to essentially detect the sun, which is the biggest neutrino source nearby. And actually that confirmed a lot of our ideas about the sun. But there's evidence that we actually saw a supernova in the large Magellanic cloud. And this is a galaxy that is, I'm trying to convert this to light years now, uh, about 75 light years, 75,000 light years away. And if you go to the Southern Hemisphere, it's, one of, it's like the big galaxy in the Southern Hemisphere. But it's so far away, like, you know, it's just another galaxy. And we're seeing these particles reach us from there, most likely. Which kind of kind of just blows my mind because it's like... But you don't know how long it took? Uh, well, it depends. Speed of light times the distance. But for neutrinos? Uh, neutrinos travel at the speed of light. Oh, they do. I thought they were traveling faster. Okay. No, the reason it, the time difference is different is because in the sun, Photons basically hit everything and bounce around. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's like pinball. The sun's a giant pinball machine for photons, but neutrinos, they don't bother. Okay. They just get the zip in a straight line. So, so that's why neutrinos take eight minutes, whereas from the center of the sun, whereas it takes 100,000 years to get from the center of the sun to the surface for photons. Because wow. photons interact with everything. Hence, I, which is why I get to see you. Changing how I'm seeing everything now, so much. 
cool. That's an amazing. It's, it's that's really describing the mechanics of how things work is actually really incredible. Yeah. That's right. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about? I mean, we've we've kind of talked about a bunch of things that have been really amazing. I have a question. I think the mechanics of the universe are just is awesome. But what, what's your question? I know that was great. Speed of light. Question? Yes, I do. Well, I mean, I know I've already asked you this before. It's just because we're, you know, here we are at the beaches in Toronto. Um, and I know I asked you before about where a good place is to see the stars in Toronto. The, the mm. answer was kind of like outside of Toronto. <laughs> yeah, there's way too much light here. I think the islands would be pretty good. You do okay. This is surprisingly very well. Um, just the horizon's a bit hazy tonight. Uh, and then I think you really have to go to like High Park or north of the city. Really, to do anything real, you have to go to the north, north of the city. Right, just because of the light pollution. Yeah, and that's kind of, and uh, you know, light pollution is just really one of these horrible things too. It's also, it's a weird thing to talk about it this way, but like, wow, well, light pollution. <laughs> You know, it's very much that a form of colonization is too, right? Because, you know, I don't know how what stories you know from your from your back your your group, your family, or your family, or my like I don't know much from mine, but they're part of them where we're from, right? Mm -hmm. What the constellations I see in Newfoundland are different than the constellations I would see in Texas, or in the Muskokas, or anywhere else. And light pollution is a way of disconnecting us from that. And I think that's in the same way colonization has historically tried to disconnect indigenous peoples from the land and from where we're from. I think light pollution is just a byproduct that's continuing that tradition. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the worst parts about Toronto is that how do you get to be related to the city and to this where we're where we're at if you can't see anything? Right. If you don't look up. Or and when you look up if you can't see much. It's just kinda of grey. You know, you yeah. see a few stars, and yeah. but I can't pick up the constellations. I met if I wait long enough, I'll probably see more people who are on CBC than I will see stars in the sky. And it's, you know, it's, yeah, it removes your relationship to place. Yeah. And people often think about place as the, the earth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, it's a 360 degree concept place. So that's true. That's a really nice observation. And also when you mention like, depending where you are in the world, you look at the sky, the sky's not going to be the same, yeah, well, right? So Even the moon, like you see the moon, there are three dark spots there. Yeah. Like, and that's, you know, uh, growing up, that'd be the man and the moon. Yeah, or, the face. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, if you're in Australia, you got to flip it over. So if you want to see what it looks like in Australia, you got to do, do a handstand. Oh, to see the moon. So, so it's, a whole, it's a different story now. Right. And so even the biggest object in the sky is a, is a, is a different uh, perspective. That's true. Or if you're seeing a rabbit up there, That's is it even a rabbit? A rabbit. Mm. rabbit on the moon. Yeah. Actually, and we also have a story about a spider. There's a spider on the moon, a rabbit in the moon, and then the uh, coward Aztec warrior. There's a lot. There's a lot on that moon. It's a busy moon. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, when we first sat down, before we turned on our mics, um, Hilding, you were sharing a little bit about the sky where you're from, where you grew up. I'm wondering if you could describe that or tell us a bit about, or even what, it seems so specific what you're doing, the work that you're doing, your research. Even thinking, I'm wondering, like, how much of that place where you're from might have shaped or informed that yeah. choice. It's so weird. It's so long. I was only in Newfoundland a couple of weeks ago, but it's been so long since I lived there. I really paid attention. But you can see the Milky Way. You can see the you know, Spirit, the Spirit Road, or Spirit River. You can see the constellations, and it's you're not alone. There are stars everywhere. You're not the stars aren't alone, and you're not alone, and everything's there in front of you, and from the horizon up, 
You can see changes, even changes in the twinkling from the horizon as the stars rise because the light goes through different amounts of the, our atmosphere. But, yeah, but it's just something I can't describe about it because it's just so much in that in the, in the picture from where I'm from, I find. That stand, it stands out. Like the, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper are right on the front of the stage. And you can't not see them. Yeah. So yeah, so it's very hard to describe in that way. And but the irony is, is I never got into astronomy because of that. Right. Um, I got into astronomy because I got into a course, or because I couldn't get into the course I wanted to get into in engineering. Um, you know, because engineers make more money. And then I got into the astronomy course and fell in love with it. Mm. And and now I don't make as much money. But that's kind of where it went. You're talking to artists about this, right? About, about Sorry, it, that's true. It's, it's all relativity. It's relativity. Oh, our loves. What a flex. <laughs> no, yeah, I take I take that whole thing that's back. Okay. So I have a question. As a, as a professional, when you look at the sky, do you just see like digits, or you know, what is your visualization of the sky now after you're doing this professionally? This doesn't have to be part of the. Internet. Oh no, it's yeah. <laughs> it's not definitely not numbers. Not the matrix. No, know. it's not the matrix. It's <laughs> no, nothing like that. It's I know less than I think I ever did. Every time I know less. Right. Partly that's because I'm kind of ignorant ignorant of where things are in the sky. Like I, if we picked a star name, I, I could tell you, probably might be able to tell you about the star. I have no idea where it is. I might have some idea from the constellation where the constellation is roughly in the sky. I feel like I know less now than I ever did. And, but at the same time, it's in that feeling less is also you're seeing more, I've seen more of the mysteries, at least from the, you know, from the Western perspective is how far away is it? What's it made of? Are there planets around that star? Are there, is there life on the planets around that star? Is the life on those planets around the star staring at us and wondering what's wrong with us? Which is probably how most people would look at us from afar. And, you know, those are the big questions. You know, what's going on? Or way beyond those stars, what was the what was the beginning? What was the beginning of our, of our universe like? From the first three minutes where the temperature was millions of degrees, and and so, sorry, that's really distracting. It's, it's almost intentional. Yeah, <laughs> it, it gives you really also gives nice creepy shadows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're entering a horror movie. But you know, it's also cosmology. We're looking at the beginning of the universe through our telescopes. If we if we could stare far enough, and with great observation, big telescopes, and or radio telescopes, we could look towards the beginning of the universe. Temperatures are starting at thousands of degrees, and the first few minutes is millions of degrees. And you go back to the first minute, hydrogen hasn't even formed yet because it's not all the sub particles that make up hydrogen. It's too hot for them to bind. And so it's like this big plasma soup and just understanding all these mysteries and then understanding why is our universe such the way it is that we can live in it. If the force, you know, we define uh, physics, physical laws of the universe based on gravity, electromagnetism and nuclear forces. If those things, those forces interact slightly differently, we couldn't possibly exist. And yet we do. We'd be a different form. We know we wouldn't even. It just, it just would be what it is. It would be what it is, but it might not be any form either. Yeah, that's true. Because the atoms might not specific. be able to bind. Which way is the center of the universe? Uh, every that's, direction that's, is. You the, had to point to it. Every direction oh, really? is the center of the universe, because the this is where this is where light oh, comes from. That's it comes amazing. To the issue here. <laughs> every that's direction. That's so true. That's the name of an artwork. <laughs> I think you just helped us coin something there. Yeah. That's the title of our next show, maybe. Every <laughs> every direction is the center of the universe. As long as it comes with the residuals. Once again, talking to artists. I didn't say they had to be big residuals. <laughs> but the reason every direction is the center uh -huh. of the universe is when we look out in the universe, we're actually looking back in time because light takes time to travel to us. So when we look 13 and a half billion light years, we're seeing the beginning of the universe. So it's every direction. Yeah, we had talked about that. Where we were to travel 600 million light years from the planet Earth with the right kind of science and look back at it, you would see the dinosaurs. Yeah, if you if we could if we could beam 
hundreds of millions of light years, yeah. And that oh, makes yeah. that makes like time here seem really really irrelevant in a weird kind of way. A little bit. It's kind of weird thinking about that because you know the universe is thirteen and a half billion years old. The sun and the earth are about four and a half billion years old. The universe will probably live a trillion years. In some respects, it makes us very, well, insignificant. Uh, but yet we get to experience it. All right, so how are you feeling about the, how things are going so far? Oh, this is fun. Yeah, okay. Uh, We're not too basic for you. No, this is good. <laughs> You're asking good questions. I actually found what you were talking about with binary stars was actually really fascinating about how you're able to measure them based on just their pull and things like that. And I really liked the, the painting analogy. That was a really nice, uh, mm. uh, relatable way. But you're you're yeah. trying to deconstruct the process good. of a painting just using... <laughs> yeah, very good uh, visuals. Yeah. You can really... And also, I think we've done... You've done a really good job of like maintaining like a narrative so when this gets eventually oh, edited you. down, I think we can get rid of some of the non, uh, what's, non sequiturs and it'll still flow really well. So. I guess uh, we're pretty, are we about ready to wrap? Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's anything else. Yeah. Mm, well, you covered stars, you got cosmology. I guess really is aliens. Is the last Ooh. Thing. I didn't know you actually wanted to be on the record for that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, let's hear what it from the expert. Is, what is your take from an expert? This is all a uh, ancestor simulation. What do you think? What are the odds? Ancestors. Uh, are, are we all in the matrix? Yeah, sort of. I think it's sort of like asking what our mirror selves would do. And it's one of those things Whoa. we can't answer. If we're actually in the matrix and the matrix is done right, we'll never know. That's true. And so. Cause like a lot of, I've read, I started, I started getting really fascinated by that. Oh, this is, cause they just seem so far fetched, but a lot of like self. leading scientists are like putting it like at 50, 50. Yeah. This is all a simulation of some type, you know? It's, it's kind of a weird way. And part of, I think, the simulation idea is the fact that our universe is too perfect. So there's a weird kind of design feature people think about. Yeah. And also, I think people just think of simulation because if we go forward in time, from our perspective, we'll reach a point technologically with computers and quantum computers that perhaps we can design a simulation of the universe that does basically this. And therefore, then we have bits and bytes that are having this conversation and eventually they'll reach a point where they'll create a simulation, have bits and bytes having this conversation. Oh, that's how that, okay. And so oh. it's a little bit under the expectation, and it's kind of arrogant in my mind, that, well, we're getting to the point where we're able to do this. So somehow there's probably some civilization somewhere that's more advanced, that's advanced enough that they could program us and we can have this com have this conversation. And so yeah. I don't really put it as 50-50. I put it as doesn't matter okay <laughs> it's it is what it That's is true. we are what we, what it, we are what we are so um, so we noticed something that was happening as well um in the past couple of years where suddenly the u.s and other countries were no longer denying ufos mm. so give us your take ufos <laughs> okay i just want to make sure that is my, that my face is blurred out <laughs> <laughs> so we, UFOs are kind of funny because we have this preconception that a UFO is a flying saucer or a triangle or something but a UFO historically is just something we never identified in right. the sky right. I think there's lots of that UDS now or something like that yeah we trying to the they're trying to change the terminology so that it sounds a little less science fictiony right and sometimes you know UFOs have been just Venus in the sky. Sometimes it's been some weird cloud phenomenon. Right. Mm. You know, various things. And the goal is to try to figure out what it is. And, you know, 99%, I think we could figure out as some sort of either mistake it's or... A, it's a banal explanation. A banal explanation. Yeah. But then there's that 1% we still don't know. Now, that I don't know if that means it's... Does, that doesn't mean it's an alien flying around and, you know, right. streaking us or something. <laughs> As in the Martian, <laughs> or it's something natural, and but we can't. You can't say that it isn't an alien because we right. haven't proven it yet. It's just very unlikely, and I think the main reason I think it's very unlikely because, you know, it's the nearest star with a planet that could probably 
have life on it is at least four light years away. And that's an exoplanet, right? Exoplanet, yep. yeah. And so if you're going to build a ship and fly it to here, that's, a, that's like a generational thing. Yeah. And then you're going to take a generational thing, fly here, right. and then just zip around and sort of play hide and seek with this. Right. It, it, it seems kind of weird and yeah. silly in some respects. And then I also I have to ask is, if you come here and spend five minutes as an advanced civilization could fly here, are you going to look at us and be like, we want to hang out with you? Right. With our nuclear weapons and pollution and reality TV? Right. <laughs> and, you know, so I kind of feel like it's probably very unlikely that alien ships have visited the Earth. It's very hard to do. Hmm. Um, but we can't just, we can't, you can't absolutely discount it. Right. I, I just think it's the conclusion people want to jump to because it's much more interesting than precipitation or some background Venus or a reflection of light from something else. Yeah, I've done a lot of reading where they, a lot of scientists, they're, they're, not ast they're not astrophysicists, they're just usually like paleontologists, those kinds of scientists, where they feel that our isolation is actually our biggest asset. Because when you look at the, when you look at the behavior of, of humans, and what humans do to each other when you know when they meet people who are different, it doesn't bode well if someone else comes along. Yeah, right. I always for think, us, or maybe even for them. But I was I find that kind of statement, uh, that kind of belief, and that's a common belief around a lot of science. Like you mm -hmm. know, Stephen Hawking was famous for sort of mm -hmm. saying, "We don't want to mess with people because they're going to come here and yeah. you know take our stuff." And my thought on that is. Why would, they? Why would they? There's a whole right. galaxy. If you could travel here, there's a lot of stars where it probably doesn't have life that you can mess with there. But also, that's not all humans that did that. I mean, yeah. let's go back 500 years. We kind of all lived here in, in Turtle Island pretty copacetically. We we're pretty content. And we had our kind of ways, and it worked out pretty well. The humans that took it were the, were probably the, what we would call the colonizers or the right. settlers. And I think we sort of talk about aliens and that kind of, you know, invasion kind of narrative from that perspective. And if I think, I think personally, if we were thinking more about, you know, alien civilizations, perhaps from more indigenous, you know, Anishinaabe, Salish, whatever perspective, would they do the same thing that, as we kind of impose that kind of settler narrative mm -hmm. towards aliens? What would the different narrative be? And I think actually they would have just avoid us because they would look down at us and say, nuclear weapons, global warming, you kill each other for, for, for liquid that comes out of the ground. We're just... Or unsalvageable. We're, we're just going to you know, keep going right. and avoid you. Uh, and I think, so I think really we oppose, a lot of our narrative around aliens, that, and this is very much science fiction, just comes from this same settler colonizer uh, ideals that are historic. Do you read a lot of science fiction? I try to. Um, I enjoy it. Uh, but a lot of this, where this came from was actually a couple of scholars who talked about this as basically like in the movies like Independence Day is mm -hmm. basically the, the modern version of the Western. Mm -hmm. Whereas, mm -hmm. and it's the same kind of settler colonial narrative. And it's a lot of time. A lot of it is, and even Star Trek is a little has a little bit oh, yeah. of that at times. Very problematic. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Well, that makes me feel a little unsettled <laughs> as a person. There's nothing in we the can world. do. I mean, it's really you know a lot. A lot of this comes down to it's out of our hands. So we just have to live now. But the, I think the thing to take away from that is not that they're going to avoid us or they're not there. It's they're somewhere up there yeah, around the are. stars yeah. and you know they're the odds are right that there's, yeah. Yeah. we're not alone yeah. Yeah. and i think that's far more reassuring to me than if we were in a galaxy or a universe alone totally isolated yeah well even jason i remember you talking about the side you know about death and this idea of becoming part of the universe and returning to the stars and that that was something that was very comforting for you yeah Oblivion, that's something I find very comforting. Yeah. And I also feel like even to situate ourselves now, like here we are on the beach, there's sand, which has another kind of reference to like, 
you know, the stars, the stars, yeah. <laughs> literally, and then yeah, kind count, of sandwiched in between. Count, count the pebbles of sand and count the stars. Yeah, because on a really clear, clear night, depending where you are, that's what it's like, right? Mm -hmm. You look up, and I can remember looking up and seeing like this incredible, infinite dome uh, of like. But ultimately, it would be just completely white over time. No, that's no? oh. That's actually a good question because this was actually this was a weird thing about cosmology, because uh -huh. people used to think in science that the universe was infinite in all directions in both time and space. Right. Uh -huh. And if there was nothing in the way, then the you know, the sky would always be white. Yeah. But because the universe is finite, light hasn't had time to reach us. But also between us and other stars is gas and dust right. and material blocking the light. So when you see like the Milky Way and all those clouds, that's dust and gas and particles. And so that blocks a lot of light too. And oh, so that, that so we get to have a dark night as opposed to basically always being blinded by the light. Right, right. Like we are now, I guess. Yeah. You're making me really aware of how um, the universe, so much of that is about space as well and be, being, you know, being aware of how the planets are moving. Like, yeah, it's not a, like this. Yeah. we're so used to thinking of like the sky as being like this flat map or, you know, like the mapping of the sky or the, yeah. Well, that's true. We're moving too. That's what we forget. Yep. Yeah, everything's yeah. So moving. So it's going to be changing all, yeah, that's true. We go around the sun every year and the sun goes around the center of our galaxy every yeah. 25, 30 million years. Right. And our galaxy is going towards the Andromeda galaxy, wow. which is the 5 billion years will merge. Yeah, everything's in motion. And galaxies are drifting, and, and, and the universe is expanding, so everything, you know, like galaxies are pulling each other apart, or pulling apart from each other. So, you know, in a few trillion years or something like that, we actually might not see other galaxies. Are you st do your studies involve entropy? Sort of, yeah. sometimes. So the idea of like decreasing well, entropy well, over time. You're talking about the end of the universe, so yeah. Yeah, so the the big freeze is one element. And there's, the end of the universe is kind of a, a weird, pro funny problem now because what we've learned, the universe is expanding. So the space between things is growing over time. Sort of like a, you take a rubber band and you stretch it. And, you, so, and so the universe is expanding the exact same way. But what we're finding is that we used to think it was like a constant velocity but now there's an acceleration. So the expansion is getting faster with time. And what we don't, that's a whole weird thing. That's dark, we call it dark energy. Yeah. And we call it dark energy because we're too lazy to actually describe something more meaningful is dark because we don't know. And dark meaning unknown. In this case, yeah. And so we call it dark energy. But what it means in the fate of the universe is we don't know. It could, we could have like heat death where as the universe expands big enough, big enough, the universe gets colder and colder and colder. And if things stop being able to produce energy, it would basically just freeze at absolute zero. Or perhaps the universe is accelerating so fast that eventually it's just going to rip itself apart. Or dark energy will change and instead of accelerating things apart, it will pull things together and we'll just snap back and have a big crunch. We, so there's the big rip, the big freeze, the big crunch. <laughs> Sounds like a nice day at the beach. <laughs> and so we have all these options. We really don't know because it's all extrapolating from one measurement of dark energy and time. But these are all these things that could happen. Right. Of course, nothing might happen. We might just slow down and be cool for the infinite time. Right. That sounds like a tasty... We won't be around for any of this anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah speak for we'll yourself. Be, we'll be long gone. <laughs> oh, really? I'll be long gone. If we're in a simulation, we can find a way, we can find a way to break it and, and live. But why? Multiples. Wow. Okay, I think we're good. Yeah? Do you yeah. feel good about this? I'm good if you're good. <laughs>